Hello, my name is Stephen Porterfield, and today we're going to discuss what a woman had to go through in, in the stages of mourning. Now, we're going to talk about a woman who lost her husband or one of her children. And there are different stages of mourning and different rules for the relationships you have with someone. So we're going to do the basic woman who lo loses her husband or a child. And there are four stages of mourning. The first stage is six months, and the second stage is six months, the third stage is six months, and the fourth stage is six months. For it, so it's two complete years of mourning. Now, everyone had a black dress at this time, pretty much like today. Everybody had a good black dress, but back then they didn't have as many clothing in their closets as we do. So when someone died and you went to the funeral, you always wore black. It was disrespectful for you to wear any other color to a funeral. And today we're gonna to talk about what a widow had to wear. In the first stage, her, the fabric of her garment would have been a dull or matte black, bombazine, fabrics like that. And she would accent them with funeral crepe. Now funeral crepe has a certain texture to it. And this is actually a fu funeral crepe this is actually a drape to go over your hat. But the, this fabric was not comfortable to wear. It's a itchy, it does not breathe well, it does not clean well, it's hot. But this was part of a widow's, um, a widow's mourning apparel. And so we know anything with this type of fabric is mourning crepe. We know for sure that anything with morning crepe on it is actually from a morning situation. So anyway, this bonnet is from the 1880s and actually it is made of morning crepe and trimmed in a matte black satin silk ribbon. And when the widow would have worn it, during that first six months, she would have had a crepe morning cover that would cover that and actually she would look through that. And anyway, crepe was the thing you wore to accent any dress. So during that first six months, if you wanted to put any accent on a dress, you would have used crepe. So this bow is made out of funeral crepe. I have two collars that are made out of funeral crepe. And this 1890s capelet is actually totally trimmed in funeral crepe. And even the lapel or lappets of it are trimmed in fun funeral crepe all the way to the bottom. Now there were all over the world, there were stores that all they created or companies that all they created was funeral attire. It was a huge business because if someone died, immediately the family went into mourning and you would have to basically put all of your normal clothes aside and buy a whole new wardrobe to wear during this time frame. And because there seemed to be more deaths, many women spent their whole lives dressed in black because they would go from a child or a husband to a sister or a brother or a mother or a father and every one of those time periods had a length where they had to dress in black. Now, it was so important as a widow, or even if you attended a funeral, that everything you wore was black. So I'll just show you, like, this, this is a black silk mourning purse. And here is, we don't know for sure that this is a morning purse because this could have been worn for any event, but this, this would have been appropriate to wear to a funeral and it's all hand knit. Here are little black fingerless gloves from the 1860s. They're all hand knit. And anyway, they would have been appropriate to wear to a funeral at the time. And after the first six months was over, the widow could actually not she could actually take her crepe off and wear lighter fabrics. So after that, she might change her veil to just your basic black silk veil, which looked like some, somewhat like this. And you see the difference in this, 
This is a mourning veil because of the band of black that goes completely around the veil. And anyway, um, also in this time frame, even a widow's hankies, while they were white, they would be lined or they would be embroidered around the edge with black thread, signifying even her hankies had to be a different way. So women were really, really they actually were, I mean, this changed their whole mode of dressing and their whole mode of life for the period of time they were in mourning. And as the mourning cycle finished, you finish the first, the second cycle, the second six months, you could wear silks and not as much of the crepe fabric. And you could actually, in the first stage, you could have linen collars and cuffs and white linen collars and cuffs. And you could add a little bit of decoration to your dress. Your first dresses would have been very plain without any frills or any fur bell, any type of trims on them. And anyway, in your second stage, you could begin to add a little bit of detail, some pleating, a little bit of design. So they would actually get to upscale their dress, make it a little bit more fashionable during the second stage of mourning. In the third stage of mourning, you could actually add some richer colors of fabrics. You could get back into silks and heavy satins and things like that. And in the second stage, the last three months at the third six month period, you could actually add jet and things like that to your ensembles. You could get a little bit of glitter happening. And, but you could not party. You could not to go to any social functions all during this time. You were not allowed into social functions until the last stage of your morning, which would have been the last six months of the two year time. So you, your whole life was like, was like changed for this period. You could go to church, you could go to shop, you could do things that you needed to do, but your social life was curtailed as well. And anyway, it must have been a hard, a hard thing. Can you imagine having to wear black that entire time and, and no color in your life? I imagine that they were happy when they could add from this black silk like this, and this would have been third stage morning, they could have actually worn a Chantilly lace shawl with a little bit of fashionable design where they had some lace and a little bit of extra detail that would have made their garments seem more beautiful and more refined. Okay. In the fourth stage, you got to add color to your wardrobe finally. You got to add grays, shades of lavender, purple, burgundy, dark blue, dark browns. And it actually was a sign to the men in the area around you that you were about ready to come back on the scene as marriageable because during the entire two years, a woman could not marry. Now the rules for women was much stricter than for men. And for men, it literally was, all you had to do was put a black band on your hat or a black band on your arm for six months of the time. And men actually had to, you know, if they had children especially, they needed to find someone to marry to take care of their children. And so men married at a quicker rate than we do today. But anyway, um, to me, it says one thing about the women and the men of that time. A man can't do without a woman, but a woman can do without a man. So I just think, you know, that was part of uh, the thing. Now there's kind of a fun, in my collection, every once in a while you see something like this, but we, there are, there were women who were bored with wearing black. And so every once in a while, you'll find this wonderful black slip. And when you line it, when you look at the lining, it will be totally lined in red or fuchsia or a deep pink. And as she got out of the carriage, you could see that bit of color as she lifted her skirt to get out of the carriage. It was, there were jokes made about it that she was a merry widow, you know. She was happy in what she was, but she gave that little bit of flash of color just so you knew she wasn't mourning quite as much as the others were. But anyway, even children, We've talked about the widow, but even children had to go into mourning 
for, for someone in their life that died. And I actually have a child's dress from about 1900 that is a mourning dress. And this dress is made, it's very simple. It's made of a black, very dull black silk. It's faded over the years to almost a brown. It's got the little ligament and style sleeves and simple, and there's not much detail at it at all. And she, just like her mother for the first stage, here is a miniature version of her mother's bonnet, and it's actually funeral crepe. So even the children had to dress, dress in black for a certain period of time after they lost a loved one, a father or a mother or a grandparent. The woman who was a mother of a child who lost a child or a husband could not wear jewelry until the third stage of mourning. She could not wear the jewelry until the last three months of the third stage of mourning. So that meant she had to go without jewelry for one year and three months before she could wear it. She could though wear her wedding ring, her wedding band, and anyway, so we're gonna talk about the types of jewelry they wore, which were of course black because that's what color they were wearing. And the early jet, that we, the stones we call jet today and that we see manufactured today are actually made of glass, mass manufactured. And anyway, back in the Victorian period, the early Victorian period, they were actually made out of coal. And anyway, the coal was all hand faceted. It was all, each, each D was hand cut. So if you look at two pieces side by, by side, a 20th century jet piece and a Victorian jet piece, you see a multitude of differences. First, the older piece, since the stones are, or the beads are hand cut, they actually are not exactly the same size, not exactly the same. You see differences in, in the beads themselves. While as a 19, a tw while a 20th century piece, well, actually all the beads will be exactly the same size because they're poured in molds and created that way. And so that's the big difference between modern jet and antique jet. Um, there were other substances that they used to create jewelry for that period that were black, like the pen on this pen right here that is actually carved flowers is made of ebony, which is a wood, it's very light. It's very beautiful. This piece here was made of gutta percha. Now they actually create gutta percha very similar to how they create rubber. It's actually the sap of trees. And most of those came from Indonesia and one other country. And anyway, they, they would actually pour it and mold it, mold the piece, and then carve details in it. And actually it was black when it was newly made, 150 to 200 years ago, but as time goes by, it becomes lighter and lighter and turns more brown, sometimes almost a greeny brown color. And so the piece, second piece you can see with flowers in it is actually made of gutta percha. The small bar pen that we have from the 1880s, 1890s is actually made of jet. And it is jet, the original jet is more of a matte finish than the sparkly jet that we have of today. The memory piece of jewelry that we have actually was made in the mid 1800s and it has a curl of hair in it that belonged to the person who had passed away. Now today people think that is morbid but that was a special memory. Women oftentimes when their little boys got to the age of four they would cut their long curls and actually they would keep one of those curls as a memory of that child's childhood. And anyway, it was the same way with death. They would keep a little bit of the hair, curl it and put it in a piece of jewelry so that they could remember that person every time they wore it. Um, over here we have a pair of bangles that are made of metal. They actually have thin layers of gold plate in between, but the black is actually painted a dull shade of, of black. So there's not much gloss, gloss to it. But this would have been appropriate for that third stage of mourning when you could wear a little bit more color 
you could add a little bit more gloss, glossy fabric and you could add trims and things to your dress. The large bar pin on the left, I mean on the right, on my right, on your left, anyway, is actually from the Edwardian period. And the glass, the jet, I mean, the stones are not jet, they actually are glass. And you can tell by the shiny character of them. So even a woman's jewelry had to be a certain look and a certain style to be, for her to be correctly attired during her time of mourning. King Albert died in December, I believe the 14th of 1861. And Queen Victoria set an example that the rest of the world followed. And she went into severe mourning for Albert and she never got out of mourning. She only wore black till the rest of her life. And we know that she lived till I think it was 1900, right? At the first part of 1900. So she mourned for Albert for 40, over 40 years. And so she set a tone for women to follow. And if you really loved someone, there were many widows who actually never went out of mourning. And so they spent the rest of their time wearing black in honor of the, that loved one that went before them. What's interesting about morning attire is that many, many different designers through the eras have used morning as a, as a tool to design new fashion. And one designer in particular that I know used it to advantage was Alexander McQueen. And anyway, you could see where he would take pieces from the Victorian stage. He took the, the um, heavy wools, the heavy fabrics, and created modern wearable clothing to sell. And whatever Alexander McQueen did, young people wanted to wear. So mourning has affected us in, the, in what we wear today. Mourning has trickled down because of current designers using it as inspiration in our wardrobes today.